Plo, and thank you for coming. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Arthur Bergeron. Uh, I am an elder law attorney. I do nothing but elder law. I work at Myrick O'Connell. There are 70 of us there, uh, and so everybody gets to do what they like, and I like doing this. Um, I am doing, a, I do a lot of, of presentations at senior centers um, and also at some assisted livings. I'm delighted to be here at Orchard Hill in Sudbury to talk about this particular issue. I'm going to be joined by Patty Surveys, who, who is probably, so she wouldn't say this, probably one of, the, one of the national experts on this particular issue, this Veterans Aid and Attendance Benefit. I remember several years ago, um, in, in the course of the work that I was doing, I would keep hearing her name brought up as, as oh, you've got to talk to Patty Surveys. She's the real expert. And so I said, to, but I had no idea where she was. And so I, find, I got a phone number, um, and I called her. And, she, and uh, I said, oh, this is a Patty Surveys? Yeah, and she said, yes. I said, well, you know, by the way, where are you located? She said, well, actually, my office is in Sudbury. I said, come on, right? <laughs> and she lives in Marlboro. So, so uh, we've done some stuff together. But she is probably, she, 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 she actually works with assisted living actually around the country about this, on this issue. So, and the reason why we're doing this presentation together is because regarding this benefit, the Veterans Aid and Attendance Benefit, um, there have been discussions nationally about changes in the regulations over the last several years. And no one knew whether they would really happen. And they've been ch morphed a bunch of times. But they just did. They got adopted. Uh, they're in effect, I believe, today. But Patty's going to talk about that. So anyway, and I'm going to talk about if you're thinking about these issues, so if you're, so let me start off by talking about my friends Frank and Mary. So whenever I do a presentation, I talk about my friends Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And I tell them, and I tell people, they have a very simple goals. They want to live in their house until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. And if they can't live in their house, then they want to live someplace that's really nice that isn't a nursing home, that isn't a nursing home. And many people, you know, five or ten years ago equated everything that looked like a nursing home, everything in a big building, including all assisted livings, with nursing homes. And finally people realize they're not the same. But so that's kind of their basic goal. And, and then whatever assets that they have, they've saved up, they want to leave to their kids. Right? So that probably may sound familiar to a lot of folks. So the question here for today is, if Frank was a veteran, if Frank was a veteran, how does that affect the way he's living at home, or perhaps in an assisted living, or eventually if he needs nursing home care, the way he'd be living in a nursing home, especially if he's slowing down to the point where he really needs some help. He needs some help with what traditionally are called the activities of daily living, which I always think of as being e eating, bathing, dressing, toileting, and transferring, which means getting around. Uh, I, I, Patty will tell you whether the, those same activities of daily living, whether the same ones, are the ones that the VA uses. And I'm going to talk at the end about if, you're, if you are a veteran or the, or the wife of a veteran or the, or the, or the, or the um, widow of a veteran uh, or widower um, and you were qualifying for the VA benefit in the short run, how would that impact you? How would the planning you did impact you if for some reason you eventually need to qualify for MassHealth, the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program? Um, and so, but, but, but first, you really need to understand the aid and attendance benefit, how it works, and that's why I asked Patty Surveys to come. So, Patty? All right, we're going to go through the VA's um, pension with aid and attendance. So, uh, let me start by following up on Arthur's introduction of me. My name's Patty Surveys. I'm a VA accredited agent, and I've been helping people get the VA's basic pension with aid and attendance since 2005. The way our company makes money, I like to lead with that so that there aren't any, you know, you're not sitting here worried what's the sales pitch at the end because there isn't one. Um, basically, we help people in one of three ways. Um, there are certain assisted livings that advertise on the Elder Resource Benefits Consulting website, one flat fee per year, and we assist all of their residents at no charge. Then um, people might be living at home or might be in an assisted living that doesn't advertise. They start with a free phone call with no obligation. And if they decide they want to move forward with us, it's a one-time fee of $800. And then we assi um, assist them with their VA benefit 
pro bono for the remainder of their life. And let me tell you, we get a lot of cards telling us that we were a big bright spot in uh, their journey through senior care. And then the third way is if you've been denied pension benefits um, for aid and attendance, for pension with aid and attendance, you can call us for phone calls free. We'll go through all the documentation and tell you if we think we have a winnable appeal. If you decide to use us to do that appeal, we get 20% of anything we're able to recover and nothing of the go forward. All right, so those are all the ways that we make our money. All right, so what is the VA pension with aid and attendance. This is a benefit that was established in the 1950s and it was to help wartime veterans and their surviving spouses stay off of welfare. So to give them a little level of security that somebody who was not a wartime veteran or the widow of a wartime veteran um, would not have. And what they say is that you have to have high medical expenses or low income so that you need some, of fin some financial assistance from the VA. This is a tax-free benefit. So this just goes through a little bit about the, um, the veteran population. Almost one out of every four adults currently receiving Social Security have served in the United States military. Um, 591,000, and of course this number goes down every day, are World War II veterans. 900,000 are Korean conflict veterans. <clears throat> 5.6 are Vietnam era veterans. So, and 7 million veterans are over the age of 65. So we've got a very big population here of wartime veterans. This does not include their surviving spouses, right? So a lot of times uh, these folks are still married or um, people who are not in these figures and have passed away, they've still got a surviving spouse out there who might qualify. Veterans are more likely to have finished high school and less likely to be poor. And Congress knows this and the VA knows this. This benefit is not designed for uh, poor. It is designed for middle class. And we're gonna go through everything and you'll, and you'll understand it by the end. That's my goal. Um, the amount of money that you can get under this benefit is quite large. And again, it's tax free. So our surviving spouses can get a maximum of 1,176 per year. Our veterans can get up to $1,830, I'm sorry, per month, per month. $1,830 per month for our veterans. Well veteran with an ill spouse, $1,436. And our married veteran, up to $2,169 per month. So this can really make a big difference. I remember one of the um, very first people that I helped was here at Orchard Hill in 2005. And after her dad got the VA benefit, back then it was probably about $1,500 per month. She said, oh my gosh, my dad has $500 left over every month. He's never had $500 left over in his entire life. So it can really be a game changer. These figures go up every time the um, Social Security benefit goes up. It goes up by the same percentage. So every time there's a cost of living adjustment with Social Security, you'll see a cost of living adjustment with this pension. So how does the pension work? There are three tests that you have to pass in order to get the pension, and they build on each other in a stair-step fashion. You have to pass the first test in order to get to the second, and then in order to get to the third, you must pass that second test. What's the first test? The first test is the military criteria, right? Because if we don't pass the military criteria, they're not gonna accept us into the military today, right? So that's our, our gating item, really, is the military criteria. You have to have served at least one day during a period of war. You have to have served at least 90 days in total for our World War II, Korean, and Vietnam veterans, which is really, I think, the age group that we're talking about here today. For our Gulf War veterans, that figure, uh, that amount of time you have to serve does increase to two years or the period for which you are called up active, whichever is less. All right, and um, the surviving spouse criteria, you have to be married to a veteran who met that criteria at the time of his death. Another way to put that is if you divorce the veteran, you divorce the benefit, okay? And you have to use <clears throat> the service 
of anyone you were in a marriage with at any time after November 1st of 1990. Right, there's some little play before November 1st of 1990 where you might be able to go back to a prior marriage and use that prior spouse's service, but they took that away for marriages after November 1st, 1990. Then there's the medical criteria, and we'll go through that in detail, what activities of daily living or regular supervision you might need to pass that criteria. And then the final one is the financial test. There's an income and an asset test. So delving into the military requirement a little bit further, you have to have served at least one day during a period of war, at least 90 days in total for our three uh, first wars, as we said, and have been other than dishonorably discharged. So I tell people all the time, if you really like the History Channel, please do not become the know-it-all neighbor next door that tells people they don't qualify for this benefit, right? Because the VA isn't basing these figures on history as we learn it, right? These war periods are dates set by Congress. So World War II, almost everybody's surprised when I tell them World War II ended December 31st, 1946. Right, that year of peacekeeping counts for wartime service. So we've gotten the benefit for people who went into the service in 46, where most people would think that, okay, it was over December 31st of 45, not for purposes of this benefit. We have the same situation with the Korean War, June 27th, 1950 through January 31st, 1955. One day during that period, at least 90 days in total and other than dishonorably discharged. We had somebody just the other day who went in in the last two weeks of January in 1955. So we were telling them, well, those were the most valuable two weeks uh, for his widow at this point in her life. So um, again, it's not the history dates. Now, Vietnam, we've got August 5th of 64 through May 7th of 1975. That's the period where it's one day during a period of war, at least 90 days in total, and other than dishonorably discharged. You'll notice I've never said you have to see combat. I never said you have to have left the United States. You could have been stationed right here in Sudbury, Massachusetts, been in the U.S. Coast Guard, never stepped foot on a boat as long as you met that one day during a period of war, at least 90 days in total, and other than dishonorably discharged. Now, prior to August 5th of 1964, we were pretending like we weren't over in Vietnam, right? The Bay of Tonkin is what changed this. So on August 5th of 64, the Bay of Tonkin happened, and we said, okay, we are over there. And for this pension, they've said, okay, and for people from February 28th, 1961 through August 4th, 1964, if you served one day in the country of Vietnam, we're gonna let you have this pension. But if you were in Germany or Sudbury, no, you have to have served in the um, country of Vietnam just for this little period only. Once we hit August 5th of 1964, we're back to our, our regular rules. And then for the Gulf War, August 2nd, 1990, through a date yet to be decided, right? We're still technically at war since August 2nd of 1990, but they changed the period of service to be two years active service instead of 90 days or the period for which you are called up, whichever is shorter. The reason that distinction is important is because very similar to World War II, Almost everybody who's in the National Guard or the Reserves gets called up active for a tour of duty, you know, it, um, you know, in the early 2000s. So you might get called up for a tour of 90 days or 120 days. As long as you complete that obligation, they're going to say you met this period. If you're National Guard or Reserves and you were never called up active, and attached to one of the branches of the U.S. military, then this benefit's not for you. It is an active duty benefit, and active duty training does not count as active duty service. All right? Any questions on periods of war? I like to say, if you meet the military criteria, this is no longer a yes or no benefit. It's if and when, because it's if and when you meet the medical criteria and if and when you meet the um, 
financial criteria. Again, surviving spouse would have had to have been married to a veteran who met this criteria at the time of their death. All right, the medical criteria for this benefit changed in October of 2016. We did a lot of advocacy with Congress to highlight the fact that um, needing two activities of daily living defined as bathing, dressing, assistance with eating, assistance with mobility, was really leaving out our folks who were in the early stages of dementia, memory loss, or Alzheimer's, who might still remember to get up and eat and shower and dress, but couldn't be left alone, right? Needed somebody to prepare the meals, might need somebody to cue them for appropriate behavior. They agreed with us and they changed the rule to the resident must require custodial care or the claimant must require custodial care. And as you can see by my little emoji, what in the world does that mean? Because if you're not in the world of VA benefits, most people think custodial care means nursing home, and it doesn't. Okay, so it is not state law. For VA benefits, it means you need the regular assistance of another person with at least two activities of daily living, or you need regular supervision due to physical, developmental, mental, or cognitive disorder, okay? So lots of times when we're working with people, they might say, oh, I don't need any, I don't need any help. I'm fine. Okay, how come you decided to live at Orchard Hill? Or how come you decided you needed home care, right? We have to peel back the onion a little bit. Um, I had one lady, her daughter was saying, oh, she didn't need any help at all. No help needed, nothing with bathing or dressing. Nope, doesn't need any help. I said, okay, well, how come uh, you decided to have her live in an assisted living? Oh, she took her pills, she put them into a candy jar, and then she ate them all. And luckily I went over to visit and I found her on the floor before any big damage was done. And I said, okay, you know what? That's not okay. That is needs regular supervision due to a, cog a mental or cognitive disorder right? No longer safe around meds, failure to thrive at home. We tell the story of what's happened. She got the benefit. I had another one where um, a gentleman, these are just some common activities of daily living. The way the benefit works, the money starts accumulating the first of the month after you file. What does that mean? That means if you send in um, information to the VA on the last business day of the month, let's say it's August because that's my story, then the benefit's gonna start accumulating September 1st. So a few years back, I get a phone call from um, these people at a facility. It's nine o'clock on August 30th and the last business day of the month is gonna be August 31st. And they said, oh, this gentleman just emergency moved his dad and didn't give us any notice at all. We had 24 hours notice moved him in from Phoenix to our assisted living here in New Jersey, and he can't make it without the VA benefit, and we do not want him to miss out on the month of September, so can you please take this call? It was nine o'clock at night. I have three kids, three daughters going to school, so it's kind of a big deal for me to say, sure, I'll do this nine o'clock at night phone call, right? So I'm talking to the son, <coughs> I'm like, okay, so what does your dad need help with? Does he need help with bathing or dressing? No, he's fine, doesn't need any help. I said, well, is he still driving? Lots of times I can, you know, if they're not driving, you can drive and get this benefit, by the way. But if they're not driving, I can sometimes figure out um, where I need to pin my hat. And um, he said, well, we didn't bring his car from Phoenix, but if he had his car, he'd be fine to drive. He doesn't need any help. And I said, okay, you know, I was told that this was an emergency and had to be done today and that you moved your dad here with no notice. So, could you tell me what the emergency is that had you lock your dad's house up and bring him to New Jersey? And he said, oh yeah, I went over to his house on Sunday, I was out there visiting him, and he invited me over for lunch, and I went there and he served me a rancid ham sandwich on green moldy bread. I said, aha, not fine, right? We'll eat inappropriate things, failure to thrive at home. Now, if I had said, um, he needs meal preparation, Okay, we don't have meal preparation up here. That wouldn't get us anywhere, right? He needs regular supervision due to a mental or cognitive disorder. He's gonna starve to death, right? He's gonna get sick. 
Is this something that would continue if he wasn't in the independent living and they were preparing his meals? Yes, the minute he moved back home again, he'd be eating the rancid ham sandwich on the green moldy bread, right? So that means we pass the medical criteria. And of course, I'm giving you the first step things that people often think aren't enough. Because of course, if you need assistance with bathing, dressing, toileting, eating, mobility, shots, adjusting prosthetics, you're gonna qualify, okay? On the medical. So who meets the medical criteria? All nursing home and memory care residents, most assisted living residents. I'll tell you one time I met an assisted living resident who didn't qualify. She'd moved in with her husband. She was well, the husband was ill. He passed away, she didn't wanna move. You know, she loved it, she had all her friends there, but she didn't need any supervision. She just wanted to stay there one time in the nearly 14 years I've been doing it. And some independent living residents will qualify. Our independent living residents who are gonna qualify are ones whose doctors have said, hey, they really need to live in independent living. You know, they're gonna eat that green uh, sandwich if they don't have somebody preparing their meals for them. Um, or any other type of supervisory or assistance with ADLs. Sometimes you might live in an independent living and get a little outside help from a home care agency, right? If you're living at home and getting help from a home care agency, you're gonna um, pass the medical criteria. So, ah, see I jumped ahead of myself because it was a big shock when they started to allow people to deduct independent living in 2012 is when they started doing that and then in 16 they really codified it and then just last monday they definitely codified it in the federal regulations and here's just a little example i need to live in al or il assisted living or independent living because i was failure to thrive at home doctor says unsafe at home because of my ailments and I need regular supervision, that equates to custodial care. Um, I need assistance with bathing and dressing, that's two ADLs, it equals custodial care. Any questions on custodial care? One thing that's important is the VA doesn't care who the person is that's helping you. Sometimes people will think, oh, my daughter's helping me, so I'm not getting any help. Nope. Your daughter counts as a person, daughter-in-law counts as a person, you know, so it doesn't matter who the person is. Moving on to the financial criteria. So what the VA says is if your income is less than the pension benefit, which we went through what the pension benefit was, right? Let's see if I can do this as fast as Arthur thinks I can. Here they are. If your income is less than this per month, you pass the income test. Now don't go stampeding out the door. I know most of you have income higher than this if you're a surviving spouse, higher than that if you're a married veteran, and higher than, than 1830 if you are um, a single veteran. But what the VA does is they have a definition of income. And that definition, oops, is what you and I would think of as income, right? Social security, pensions, interest, dividends, IRA distributions, oil well royalties, your rental income, those all count as income, but as long as you pass that medical criteria, you get to deduct what you pay to a place like Orchard Hill, what you pay for Medicare premiums, what you pay for your medical insurance premiums, your long-term care insurance premiums, you get to deduct those out, any home care charges you have, to come up with what your actual income for VA purposes are. So. The first time I gave this speech, uh, I used this example, so I'm gonna use it again today. I said, let's assume that your monthly income is $3,000, right? And you're paying $4,000 to live in your assisted living. What's your income for VA purposes? It's negative $1,000, right? And you pass the test. Because if your income is zero or negative, you're looking at the full benefit. If it's positive, you're looking at a partial, but we're gonna stick with our full benefit right now. So the next day, I get a phone com call from this man and he says, hey, surveys, I was at your speech yesterday and I wanna know what kind of game you're playing. 
And I said, what do you mean? And he said, I just called the VA and they told me my dad had too much in income and he was never going to qualify. And I said, what did you say to the VA? And he goes, funny enough, exactly your example. And I said, well, can you humor me and tell me how the conversation went with the VA? What'd you say to them? And he goes, oh, they said, how much does your dad have an in income? I said, $3,000 a month, $36,000 a year. And then he stopped talking, but I wasn't done listening. And eventually he goes, hello, are you still there? And I said, yes, I'm waiting for the part where you told them, but he pays $4,000 a month to his assisted living. So he's negative $1,000 a month in income, negative $12,000 a year for income. And he said, I didn't say that, I gotta go. And he hung up on me, true story. That's why the most important thing that you're gonna learn today and that I really want you to remember is anytime somebody asks you from the VA, what's your income? You must remember it's a math problem, right? It is not what we think of as income. It's what is income minus what you pay to Orchard Hill, minus what you pay to independent living, minus what you pay to home care, medical insurance premiums, not co-pays, premiums, okay? And, um, that's, that's really super, super important. Everybody got that? Yeah. Okay. So what happens if our situation's reversed, right? And you have $4,000 a month in income and your medical expenses are $3,000. You're left with $1,000 positive. What's the VA gonna do? Very simplified, there's some other things going on here, but basically they're gonna take that thousand dollars that you're positive and minus it from the benefit and give you the remainder. So our um, surviving spouse, 1,176 minus a thousand, she'd get $176 a month, right? Our married couple, 2,169 minus a thousand, they'd get 1,169. Right? Still a decent amount of money. But what's really beautiful about that partial award, because I have had people say, oh my goodness, it's not worth it to do all that paperwork to get $176 a month. I was a CPA prior to doing this. You know how much paperwork I've done that I don't get a monthly amount for? A lot. So I think it's worth it to get the 176. But in addition, that $1,000 that you left on the table is building up for you at the VA in a flexi-spend type of account. You know how I said you couldn't deduct your um, prescription co-pays? It had to be these regularly occurring monthly um, medical expenses that the VA allows. Well, at the end of the year, if you're not receiving the full benefit, in our example, you've left $12,000 on the table, you can submit those types of expenses and the VA will reimburse you up to the amount you left on the table. So you would say, you know, I got new eyeglasses, I got a hearing aid, I bought Depends, I had um, prescription co-pays, dental work, whatever was going on, and they would add that up, and as long as it was less than $12,000, they would give that to you. All right, make sense? Okay, so here, um, look, see, I, I talked over my next slide. This is exactly what I was just telling you. Okay, so let's do some math, like we haven't already done enough, right? So in our example, a resident with 35,000 in assets, income of 2,000 and a monthly facility fee of 4,000 would be out of their assets in 17.4 months or approximately a year and a half, okay? Now if they were a surviving spouse, that, those figures change once that 1,176 comes in to 3.5 years, okay, versus 1.45. So we get two additional years of being able to pay for our assisted living. And that's just if our assets are 35,000. For a veteran with that 1,800 a month, we're looking at a change to 17 years. It's big. And a well veteran with an ill spouse, what that means is the veteran himself is fine. He might even still be living at home, right? But his wife needs custodial care. They can get up to $1,436 per month. So that would change these figures to say it's gonna last five years. In our married couple, since we're only negative $2,000 in this example, Theoretically, the um, assets would last indefinitely because they're not in a negative cash flow situation. 
I put Frank and Mary in here for Arthur. Yes, yes, they're your Frank and Mary. I got to figure out a way to put in Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Okay, so maximum assets allowed. This is a new um, regulation that the VA just put out last Monday, and uh, right around September 18th, and it goes into effect on October 18th, 2018. Previous to this regulation, we could get pe some people the benefit who had up to $250,000 in assets. Now the amount is $123,600. So people who previously might have been told that $60,000 was too much in assets to have or $80,000 was too much, they can all have up to $123,600. This number is tied to the Medicaid community spousal um, benefit uh, asset amount, and so this will adjust every time Medicaid adjusts the, um, that asset amount. This applies to you whether you are a single surviving spouse, a single veteran, or a married couple. It's one asset number. Married couple is looked at as a unit. So you can have up to 123,600. Um, there is a three-year look back period so if you've transferred assets in the last three years, you would want to file before October 18th, 2018, because they're going to start looking at um, asset transfers that occurred after October 18th, 2018. What counts as an asset? Basically, everything that you think of as an asset is going to count. Cash, stocks, bonds, securities. Your home and, so your primary home, one home, and your car and your personal effects do not count as assets. Your primary home doesn't count as an asset even if you're living in Orchard Hill. But if you rent it out, now it's an investment property and it would count as an asset. If you sell it and receive cash, that cash would count, all right? So the three year look back period. They stated that they will not be looking at transfers before, that occur before October 18th, 2018. However, in the example, in the back of the regulation, they say, oh, somebody applied on November 1st, 2018, and they did a transfer on August, in August of 2018 and in September of 2018. We've asked them to clarify. Did they mean to have 19, you know, 2019 as the year, or, are they going to be looking, are they not looking at transfers as long as the application was on file by October 18th, 2018? We are going to, we are treating, without clarification, we are treating it as let's get your application on file before October 18th, 2018. We do not want to get caught here. Um, if the transfer was made during the look back period, so let's, you know, say that you had a transfer it's in a look back period, then we have to do some calculations to come up with when you should file. So here it is, an example. Don't try to read it. I'll try to explain it to you. So let's say that uh, the net worth limit is 123,600. Um, you have to add annual income back if you're positive. You know how I went through that partial um, example with you guys and they were positive $1,000? If you were in that situation, we would have to add um, $12,000 to your total assets. But for our purposes, let's say that you're in a negative situation. Maybe you're negative $1,000. So then we would say your annual income is zero. And you have total assets of $125,000. Well, that's over our $123,600. So we know we're not going to qualify. And we transferred $30,000 by gifting. So what the VA would say is, okay, $30,000 is the only amount we're calculating the penalty on. There's no penalty for being at 125 versus 123. And during the penalty period, you'll be eating through that. So by the time the penalty period's over, you'd be below 123,600. And how they would calculate the penalty is they would take the 30,000 and they would divide it by 2,169. Does that number look familiar to anybody? 2,169. It's the maximum amount that a married veteran can get if he needs the aid and attendance of another person. And that's the denominator they use for everybody. So we divide the transfer amount that is um, over the 123.6, divide it by the 2,169. This person would be excluded for 13.8 months. 
right? So we might say, hey, let's wait until that, it, the penalty starts, um, the clock starts ticking the day after the transfer, right? So if you transferred in September, we would say, okay, 13.8 months, let's file in, what would that be, November? Maybe December, since we got that 0.8. Um, so if your total assets were 120 and you had transferred 30, they would minus that 3,600 from it and come up with a penalty um, asset amount of 26,400. Dividing that by our 2,169, we get to 12.7 months. Now this penalty can be as high as five years, all right? So you would never want to file and kick off a five-year penalty when the look back's only three, three years, right? You would wait until that three-year period had definitely passed, and then you could file, and they would never go look at that three years in the past. Does that make sense? No? Okay. So the way the benefit starts working, let's say you haven't transferred assets, the um, money starts accumulating the first of the month after you notify the VA that you're going to be filing. So we like to say a month's delay is a month's lost pay. So sometimes, unfortunately, we hear from people, oh, I moved in in you know, February of 2018. They told me that um, the benefits were retroactive, so now I'm here talking to you and it's September. No, they're not retroactive to the first of the month after you move in. They're retroactive to the first of the month after you file, okay? Some common myths about this benefit are that when a veteran or spouse is in a nursing home on Medicaid, that the other spouse can't get this benefit. Not true. When a married couple, one of them in a nursing home on Medicaid, the person not in a nursing home can get the full 2,169. Um, one I touched on a little bit, the um, veteran who's healthy and living at home and his wife is getting home care, either at home or is in a facility, he can get a maximum of 1436. Those folks, unfortunately, a lot of times are told that they can't get anything. And a lot of folks are told there is no partial benefit. There is a partial benefit, we get it for people all the time. So that's it, now I'm gonna turn it over to I Arthur just, Bergeron. I want you to stay here just okay. for this example and then I'll convert. Okay. So there's I'll my example. So Frank and Mary have a house, $400,000. They've got an IRA with $200,000. They've got bank accounts worth $200,000. So they get a total of $800,000 in assets. Assume that Frank is a veteran medically eligible, right? Okay. Um, and assume that he is spending $6,000 a month Right, and that he's got income of three thousand dollars a month. So he's uh, no, just so it'll be easier. Say that he's got an income of two thousand dollars a month, so he's short four thousand dollars. Okay. What would Frank do if Frank wanted? How would you think out what Frank could possibly do to qualify? Okay, so uh, if he hurried up and did it before October eighteenth, yeah. we'd be we'd be good. I would advise that you um, speak with your tax accountant or attorney. Yeah and figure out the maximum amount you can take out of your IRA tax-free, given that your entire assisted living fee is considered a medical expense, as long as you meet that medical criteria we were talking about. Because the IRS's definition of being able to deduct the cost of the facility is the same as the VA's, right? So you want to start getting as much of that IRA money out of there as soon as possible, because when you draw on an IRA, it's considered income. And so if you save that till the end, even though 200000 in cash, 200000 in a bank account, when you draw out of your bank account, it doesn't go into that top line income test. But every time you take it out of the IRA, it does. So since you need to wait to get down to the asset amount anyway, you need to start whittling away that IRA. Um, you, you know, since we've got uh, 400000 you would do the math to see, okay, when am I gonna get to 123,000? Is it more than you know three years from now? And kind of do a, an analysis, is it worth it to transfer assets? Keeping in mind what's going on with Medicaid. And, 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 and but the house would be exempt. So that, so that once, exempt. You've, once you've dealt with the cash, mm -hmm. even if you're living and you're assisted living, the, the house is still an exempt asset. So That's not, correct. you're not worried about that. That's right. So one trivia question regarding that. So as, you, as we've spoken about in the past, a lot of the veterans' benefits have traditionally been, been used as a sales pitch by annuity salesmen saying, well, 
what you do is you take some of your cash, you turn it into an income stream, right? Mm -hmm. And then you can qualify. And, and, and in the situation that I just get, that I was that I was giving you, if you've got a six thousand dollar per month um, uh, assisted living bill, yeah. you've got a two thousand dollar per month income, right? I guess the question would be, could you take some or all of that cash and turn it into an annuity that would be paying you some or all of that gap between or no, let's do it a different way. Say that your assisted living is six thousand dollars a month. Your income is two thousand dollars a month. Your maximum veterans benefit would be will round two thousand dollars a month. Okay. So you're still short too. So you could you take some of that cash and turn it into an annuity to cover up to that two thousand dollars a month, thereby reducing the amount of cash that you have while right. not losing any of your benefit. Not after October eighteenth. No. And can you tell me what why that is? is because it, they decided that it yes, it's a prohibition against transferring the assets to trusts or annuities. Or to purchasing an annuity. Or to purchasing an annuity. Yep. I see. If your annuity doesn't have a cash out value um, that proves that you paid fair market value for it, you got yeah you can get at those assets, they're going to take the purchase price of that annuity and use that as the asset value. I get it. So you could do it, but you would be looking at a three-year look back. But you'd still be looking at regarding the purchase of the annuity. That's right. But let's say that you bought, and I should have brought my phone up here so I have my calculator, yeah. right? Um, any, if you buy an annuity that's $78,000 or more, yeah. right, that's going to keep you out for three years. Right, so if you do the math, you're like, wait a minute, I can get this annuity and it's yeah. gonna pay out for five, eight, 10 years, whatever it is, it still might be a better financial thing for you to, to do that and wait your three years before because you get in. Because you'll be getting past the three years. Yes. Uh, I was gonna do 100,000. This is the CPA but. versus the lawyer. So <laughs> a lot of lawyers went to law school because they couldn't do this, right? They couldn't do the numbers, right? So if you transferred $100,000, you'd be looking at 3.8 years. And the other thing that you can do is you can say, well, what are my assets gonna be in the future, right? We do a whole yeah. run out that shows you what they're gonna be because you might be able to reduce your penalty period because if at two years you're gonna be left with $80,000 in assets, that means that the first um, uh, 43600 isn't going to be included in your penalty calculation. I see. Right? And you can yeah. really, so it's a, it's a teeter-totter, and this yeah. is when we want to file. And so the, the, the moral of the story, and, and I, I just want to talk for a while about how all of this would be affected if someone were trying to then qualify for mass health. The moral of the story is a lot of these are math problems, right? Don't assume that you're entitled to or not entitled to the benefit until you've talked to somebody that really knows how to do this math. This is kind of like very specialized math. I want you to stay here so we can answer questions together because I'm just gonna go very briefly. So assuming that these are the assets and assuming that Frank and Mary are now in an assisted living community and then Frank needs to qualify for um, Mass Health, the way that you qualify for Mass Health, if Frank needed to qualify for Mass Health, today, um, see that $123,600? Does that sound like a familiar figure? That's a number that, that, uh, that uh, Patty just used. For Frank to qualify for Mass Health, say he needed nursing home care today, he would need to show that he had uh, less than $2,000 in countable assets. However, his wife, Mary, say that he were in a nursing home and Mary were here. His, his, Mary can, could actually own the home, could own the home, can have up to $123,600 in other cash or cash equivalent assets and can't have unlimited income. So that if it weren't for the veteran's benefit, right? And it may be that in this situation, Mary wanted, may want to say, ah, the heck with the veteran's benefit. I just want to qualify for mass health. Mary could take that whatever extra money that she has, the amount over $123,600 and use it to buy that annuity. And, 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 and as long as that annuity calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than Mary's actuarial life expectancy, if Mary were 80 years old, her life expectancy would be about 10 years. Um, the purchase of that annuity in any amount is a legitimate conversion from a countable asset to a non-countable income stream. The day after Mary bought that annuity, Frank could qualify for mass health. So I guess what I'm suggesting to you is all of the planning that Frank did in order to qualify for the, for the VA benefit, right? If he's now on the VA benefit by virtue of having done that, 
and he then needs nursing home care, he's immediately going to qualify for MassHealth because yeah. he will have already rearranged his assets so that he may have the home. They've got less than $123,600, right? Yeah. Right? And, and if for some reason um, Frank is, has decided to, to not get that VA benefit, right, but then needs nursing home care, he can still probably qualify for Mass Health very quickly. And once again, the basic reason is, the difference is for, for, VA, for VA purposes, the couple's assets are considered to be uh, total, and the couple can't have more than $123,600. For purposes of qualifying for Mass Health, though, if Frank were in a nursing home, only his assets count. Mary, or he, he can have less than two, he has to have less than 2,000. Mary can have up to 123,600, but Mary can have unlimited income, right? So, with all of that, there's a ton of information. But by the way, with Mass Health, as with the VA benefit, it's all a math problem. It's about figuring out the math. And, and what I tell clients is it's your decision what you do with your money, right? But, but if you're trying to figure out the math problem, talk to a professional. If you're trying to figure out the tax problem, talk to your CPA. If you're trying to figure out the mass health problem, talk to me or another elder law attorney. If you're trying to figure out the VA math problem, talk to her. Talk to her. Any questions on any of this? I know we covered a ton of material, and we're happy to stay afterwards to answer individual questions, but just checking from anybody. If not, can I have a quick round of applause for my friend Patty Survey? And for oh, Arthur. I think it's great. Oh, I think it's great. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you very much for coming, and uh, we're happy to stay around and answer individual questions if you've got any. Thank you very much, and thank you to the folks from Orchard Hill for inviting us to speak today, which we really thank appreciate. You. Thank, thank you. For